Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today, both in Zoom and in person. Uh, my name is Laura Swanzerich. I'm the Advocacy Manager at Downtown on the Go. We are the nonprofit advocate and resource for all things transportation in Tacoma. Uh, we're really excited to offer these forums in a hybrid format. Uh, it's really nice to have a couple of folks in the room with us um, and still have folks able to join us on Zoom. Um, for folks who are on Zoom, there are automatic closed captions that you can turn on by clicking the um, closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. All right. Uh, so for our 2024 Friday Forum series, uh, we're exploring what it means to build strong communities through a focus on health equity, youth mobility, and housing density. Uh, today, we're discussing youth mobility. Uh, we're looking at changing patterns in how young people get around and why that matters. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the forum. Uh, for folks in the room with us, um, you can uh, write up your question on a piece of paper. Um, if you don't have one, let us know and we'll make sure you get one. Um, and I'll collect those towards the end. Um, for folks on Zoom, you can put your questions into the Q&A at any time. You don't have to wait until the end. I want to give a really big thank you to the Office of Community Partnerships at University of Washington Tacoma um, for partnering with us to allow us to use this space and be able to do this in a hybrid format. We really appreciate it. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Tanisha Jumper. Uh, Tanisha is the Chief Communications Officer for Tacoma Public Schools. And Tanisha, go ahead and get us started. Hey, thank you guys for being with us today. Um, we have a really interesting conversation and I have a feeling it's going to go really fast. So I'm going to try really hard to stay on, on time and on topic. Um, but coming into this last night, I was lucky enough to be a part of the Boys and Girls Club Youth of the Year um, event. Um, and there was a lot of really great kids. So shout out to that. If you didn't missed it or you want to see it, it, it will be on, I think, TV Tacoma. It will air it through the rest of the month if you want to hear the speeches. But there was one of the candidates for Youth of the Year who talked about moving and wanting to get to the Boys and Girls Club and having to walk a mile to get to a bus stop to get to the club and how determined she was to do that. And I thought it's such a great like thing to have in my mind as we start this conversation today about how we make it hard or complicated for people just to navigate the spaces around them. And when we're talking about young people wanting to stay out of trouble, get their lives on course, go to college, whatever those things are, how big a, a, a part of that public transportation is. And so with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our very, very cool panel today. Um, and I'm going to ask you to first, um, Introduce yourself, tell, share with the group a little bit about, you know, what is your role in um, transportation or even how kids are navigating the city. Um, and if you happen to be not quite a kid, but maybe a college student, um, share like how your, ex your experience with navigating the city as well with, through public transportation or other modes. And I am going to start with you. everyone. There we go. <laughs> My name is McKenna Lux. I use she, her pronouns. I am the events and engagement manager at Transportation Choices Coalition, uh, or TCC for short. We are a statewide nonprofit advocacy and education organization. Uh, my connection to this uh, topic today on youth mobility is going to be drawing from a project that I led last year with TCC, um, that was a series of focus groups with people who are 18 and younger. This was after the passage of Move Ahead Washington that spurred a lot of the youth ride free policies across the state. Uh, so really excited to be here. And I'll pass it. Great. Thanks, McKenna. Um, hi, folks. I'm uh, Matt Kelly. I'm a professor at the, well, at this university in the School of Urban Studies. <laughs> uh, I've got a background in community development and um, cartography. Uh, we call it GIS, Geographic Information Systems. Um, in essence, I'm, I'm interested in participatory work, how we, how we engage with uh, um, residents, uh, particularly youth, and activate their voices in planning and decision-making processes. So for when it comes to transportation, I'm focused largely on active transportation and walkability. So we, you can call it both things. They're essentially the same thing. Um, public transportation is a part of that. These are all, all non-car forms of getting around. So I'll talk more about what I do uh, with the action mapping project in a few minutes. 
My name is Fletcher Crone. I'm a student at the University of Puget Sound here in Tacoma. I've lived here for three years. Um, and my um, experience with active transit and transportation comes in the form of bike bicycling. That's um, what I'm most well versed in. That's what I've got experience using around here in Tacoma. So I'll talk a lot about my experience with cycling in the city, um, the problems I see with it, the benefits I see with it, and uh, things like that. So yeah. All right. So um, Matt, do you want to tell us a little bit about the the action mapping project and? maybe some of the things you've learned or trends that you've seen um, as you've done this work. I think me and you were on this panel a couple of years ago um, and uh, talked about it when you were in the kind of beginning stages of that. So, yeah. yeah. Sure. So um, I've got just a, just a few minutes. So I can't get in too much depth, but at the end of this, if you want to hear more about uh, the action mapping project, I'm happy to, to, to share um, that. So at the university, I, I do run AMP. Um, which is Action Mapping Project. Um, what we do uh, is to go out into the community um, and work with youth in schools. So I've got a team of undergraduate students here at the university, and our goal with the, with the project is to engage with youth in the region. So currently work, we're working with all middle schoolers and high schoolers in the city of Tacoma, so in Tacoma Public Schools, and then middle schoolers and high schoolers in Franklin Pierce Schools. So we're working with about 30 schools this year. At each school, we run workshops in 20 classes. Um, in a workshop, we are asking kids to respond to a series of prompts um, by drawing on maps. Uh, it's, it's kind of a fun project. I've been doing it for a long time. Tanisha and I have been bouncing these ideas around for 10 years now, I think. Um, we started in neighborhoods, and now we're working um, almost entirely with youth. This year, we should work with about 8,000 um, kids in the region. Um, all of the, the responses that they share with us when they draw on a map, they're responding to things like, uh, what routes are you using when you walk around your neighborhood, when you bike around your neighborhood? Um, where are you spending time when you're, when you're not at school and you're not at home? Um, what routes are you avoiding when you're, when you're walking around or biking around? So not, not you don't go there, but uh, you actively avoid these, these particular routes because uh, they're dangerous or there's too much traffic or they're not complete sidewalks, whatever it is. Um, what we're trying to do, and, and we're no longer trying, we're kind of moving out of experimental stage into scaling, which is how we're in 30 schools this year. What we're doing is generating big data about youth perception and experience of space and also of uh, active transportation. So we're learning a lot of lessons. Uh, kids are sharing a lot. Um, from the data that we generate, we, we're surfacing opportunities to do small things like at a crosswalk or big things like uh, deal with speeding or accidents or congestion or, or um, overgrown brush or no street lights, things like this. Um, what I've learned is that uh, kids tend to share experience. Um, if you talk to, this, to, to, to 100 kids from the same school, they're probably going to tell you the same thing. Um, and that thing may be, we all walk this roundabout route to get from school to the grocery store after school to get snacks. And when you say, why didn't you take the direct route? They'll say, because that's really not safe. And everyone who walks that route gets hit by cars. Um, what I'm also finding, and I think this is really interesting and key for us as we're thinking about active transportation and public transportation, is that there's, there, there is a diversity of experience. Um, we can't take for granted that what we see in uh, parts of Tacoma are true for kids in Parkland or Spanaway or Midland or South End or East Side because we, have, um, we don't have a homogenous transportation system. We don't have complete sidewalks. We don't offer the same bus public transit access to kids around the region. Um, and kids struggle with that. Mm -hmm. They wanna get places, they wanna be places, uh, but they can't always get there safely. What that means, and this is, this is a point I was, I was making a couple of days ago at a, at a long meeting with Metro Parks and the city of Tacoma and the health department. What that means is that uh, kids aren't getting outside. Um, more than 50% of the 3,000 kids that we've talked to to this point report that they aren't getting outside, out of their homes, out of their school more than a few times a month. 25% um, of kids report that they never leave their home or their school to get outside. And when you ask them why that is, there's a couple of answers. One, there's nothing to do, and I'm perfectly happy at home with my screen. Um, two, 
I can't go out because there's no way for me to get anywhere. And that's more a problem, I'd say, in unincorporated um, parts of Pierce County and then uh, south and east sides of Tacoma, where we know we have transportation problems. So um, I'll talk more about the project later, I think, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it off. Yeah, um, I think those are interesting. I think two of my thoughts about that were we, there's a there used to be a program called Kids Voting, and they would have kids vote in class, and like that that voting process was almost a hundred percent accurate. Whoever won in the kids vote won in the national election. And when I think about where kids are saying this is safe and not safe and what their perception of safety is probably directly tied to also how the adults in their world view the spaces yeah. around them, right? Yeah. So so there's more than just kids avoiding certain areas and certain parts of town. And there's parents telling kids that is not a safe place for you to be at. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially with with middle schoolers, they're not going where mom and dad say don't go. Exactly. And, or, or they're just not allowed out of their house. Yeah. Um, Another interesting thing I found working with the uh, South End Neighborhood Council a couple of years ago is that kids' experiences and perceptions of our spaces don't diverge much from adult experiences and perceptions of neighborhood spaces. So kids really do see the same things we see and experience mm -hmm. the same things we experience, but they also experience their own trauma and drama yeah. of being teenagers. Yeah, then then I think about, like, I'm a, I'm a Gen X, and um, I think about I literally was outside all day every day nobody was monitoring me i grew up in south um pierce county and, and so like the lakewood stillicum area and i literally got on my bike in the morning and drove road bikes through Farrell's marsh all the way down to the beach and back and nobody there's no sidewalks there's no none of that but there was a not the the feeling of safety worries in the same way that when i then became a parent and if my kids were like, I want to ride my bike to the beach and be down there all day unsupervised. <laughs> no, sir, you will not. So um, so I think that like all of those things and what it's creating for, for kids, but I hate that idea that kids are not going outside. Um, There's a compounding factor, and then I'll pass it off. The compounding factor is we are coming out of pandemic when <laughs> kids have spent many years of their formative uh, childhood sitting inside waiting yep. for the pandemic to end or just assuming that this is the world now. Um, so breaking, giving, or not breaking free, but uh, providing kids the opportunity to break out of that mindset is is on us. Yeah. And uh, we need to get creative and clever uh, pulling kids out of their houses and into public spaces. Yeah. And that's a perfect segue into our next question. McKenna, you've talked to kids about why they are or not accessing and with the, the youth ride free program. And so can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned and, and what those kind of ex experiences have been. Yeah, so two years ago, the state legislature passed a, a big transportation funding package called Move Ahead Washington. And one thing that happened from that is that agencies across the state, just about every one, uh, adopted a new youth ride-free policy. So that means that uh, if you're 18 or younger, then you get to ride the bus, the light rail, any kind of public transit uh, free of cost. So that's incredible. <laughs> Um, we at, at TCC, we saw this as a really huge opportunity to help raise a new generation of transit riders. With these new policies, more than 1.6 million Washingtonians have access to free transit. Um, and we see that being used in, in Pierce County alone last year, we saw, I like, I like the whole numbers. So I'm going to say it all 821,628 youth trips on Pierce transit vehicles. So that's incredible. <laughs> um, and we know though, that fares are just one piece of the equation. And so as an advocacy and education organization, we wanted to learn more directly from this demographic and see how else you want to be supported. How else can we help you become lifelong, confident transit riders? And so we held a series of focus groups, uh, talked to over 100 uh, people in that, in that age range um, from across the state, but several of them were from Tacoma and Puyallup and Bonnie Lake. Um, about what their perspectives, their experience on transit is like, what's working, what could what could be improved. Uh, we have a whole report published on our website, and I'm happy to share that with anyone who would like to read more. Um, but some of our key takeaways from that were, first off, that uh, climate change is extremely important to young people, and that really shapes how they view mobility and getting around. 
Uh, we learned that frequency and access are really critical to, to young people and they want um, to see to see this in a way that benefits everyone. So everyone can get where they need to go quickly uh, and not have to go very far for stops. And then lastly, this was my favorite one. <laughs> we learned that young people really love friendly bus drivers. Um, and so I'll get into that in a sec, but that was my favorite one. <laughs> um, so yeah, perhaps unsurprisingly, climate change is a huge concern for a lot of young people. We asked them in these focus groups what is important to them when they think about their future, transit or otherwise, and a vast majority of the people we talked to said that not only is climate change a huge concern for them, but that they understand that transportation is really linked to our environmental health, and they see a lot of potential in a transit-centric world to helping unlock the, the potential there. Um, one thing that I thought was really insightful that several of the participants were able to draw connections to also was that in order to unlock this potential, we have to have uh, really frequent and really accessible transit so that it is the best way, the easiest way for everyone to get around. And so that was just one example of how they were able to tie frequency and access to deeper and uh, you know more, more rooted uh, issues within transit. They... They also saw that frequency and um, and access when when the bus takes a long time to get where they need to go or they have to walk a long way to get to the bus stop or their destination. For, for the kids who have a choice in how they get around, this was often a deterrent for using transit. And for those who don't have a choice and that they rely on transit, it had significant impacts on how they spend their day and how they use their time. Um, we heard that there were a lot of connections being drawn to between frequency and access and safety. Um, if someone's waiting at a bus stop for a really long time, then that contributes to the, I mean, that's that, yeah, contributes to a negative experience uh, overall for them. They also heard this was, we heard this a lot actually from the people in Tacoma who we talked to, that in the times just before and after school, there's a, and communities where there's a lot of, of teenagers taking the bus to school, um, that also has a negative impact on their safety when there is just, uh, you know, infrequent service paired with overcrowding. They don't like being all, you know, crammed in together. They like seeing high ridership, but not to the point where it's making them feel uncomfortable or unsafe on the bus. Um, and then lastly, we heard that being able to promote transit as a reliable and safe and overall great way to get around can really go a long way in combat combating um, a negative stigma that a lot of the young people we talk to are experiencing. And they want to see transit be promoted as a wonderful way to get around by all of us adults <laughs> um, to, to help them navigate that. Uh, Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think I think you said a couple of things that are are really interesting. I, I think to Matt's earlier point that like kids are not are not a monolith. You know, there is they um, there's some kids that need that's their only form of transportation. Like the the young woman last night who was talking about trying to get to the boys and girls club. Like that's that's her only way. And so when it's not reliable and it takes too long, that's a problem. Then you have the kids like I did a forum over at Mount Tahoma where kids were saying they're actually it's not getting on the bus at Mount Tahoma. It's when they get dropped off and then they have to walk far in the dark at night and, and girls being whistled at by cars driving by and things like that that make them not feel safe riding the bus. And so those are things that we have to really, one, listen to youth and say, okay, well, we're going to have our police patrol these areas, you know, where we know kids are walking after school. Like, what are, what can we do as a system to do it? And I think um, probably, and Laura's probably hear, sick of hearing me talk about this quote. Somebody said, you know, a couple a couple of forums ago about that certain people are paying in time or money, and it and and when you are low income and you don't have as many options, you're either paying money <laughs> to get around places or you're paying in your time. And if we have a system that's not efficient, we're asking kids who are sometimes having to work jobs after school to help support their family to also then be on a bus. Um, and I think that that kind of transitions me over to, to Fletcher because then there's also the, the co compounding of the cost to live 
and then the cost to maintain a car and put gas in it and the choice that a lot of young people are making now not to be drivers. And it, there is some of it that is based on climate change. And then there is also the reality of housing keeps going up and up and up. Jobs aren't keeping up with that. And so then there's people that are like, I can drive and get around quicker, but I'm now paying for a car, car insurance, parking, maybe parking where I live, parking where I work, all of those things. And it doesn't make sense. The Delta is, is too big. And so I'm going to choose not to. And so as a college student, like tell us about your experience and like what you hear from your peers, maybe on campus and the things you see on campus. Yeah. So in my own experience, um, I choose sustainable transportation for that, um, for that purpose. Um, but there's also a lot of other purposes such as climate and mental health, but specifically with costs, like you were saying, it's not just owning a car and purchasing the car, it's maintaining it, it's filling it up with gas, it's parking at multiple different places. Um, so there's a lot of costs that people don't really see with, with owning a car, but it, it adds up and it's prohibitive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's that aspect of it. There's the climate aspect. I think my generation and, and younger generations too are much more acutely aware of the effects of climate change. So they kind of understand um, where, where their emissions are coming from, where their impact is felt when they're using transportation. And especially in, in Washington, transportation is the number one source of emissions um, statewide. Okay. Um, it's something like 40% of emissions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so people are aware of that, especially in, in my generation and younger generations. And then I'd say another thing that people don't really acknowledge as much is driving can be really stressful. Driving is like a, a big negative impact on a lot of people's days. You can be stuck in traffic for hours. You can be uh, mad at other drivers around you. It, it, it builds up and it's, it's a negative impact that isn't really acknowledged, I think, by most people. It's just taken as that's, that's how it is. That's, that's the only way. Um, and, and yeah, that, that I would say that those are the three factors that um, inform my decision to take, uh, take the bike places or, or not drive. Um, and I know that other students feel the same way. They want to um, bike or they want to take the bus, but there's things blocking them from doing that. There's safety concerns, especially with biking and, and taking the bus. And, and there's uh, issues of inclusivity, like feeling welcome taking the bike places or, or taking the bus somewhere. Um, so there's, there's things that keep people from jumping into that even when they want to. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm good friends with Noah Struthers and if anybody knows Noah, he's the, you know, one of the founders of a second cycle. And he talks a lot about the lack of safe infrastructure for people to ride. And I think Pierce County has a really, someone in here probably knows like the, the, the numbers for, you know, accidents of people riding. And you, when we were first meeting, you talked about like even that of like some super narrow roads and people driving really fast and then trying to navigate that on a bike. And, you know, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Especially uh, around the university of Puget Sound, there's really surrounding the university on, on all four sides, basically there are extremely, fast roads in the middle of residential areas where people go 40, 50 miles an hour. Um, and it is completely unsafe to, to bike down those roads, but that's kind of your only option um, at times. So that's people, people see that and they say, why, why would I ever want to bike down that road? And that's, that's a, a, a barrier for, for getting into it. Um, and if, if it's, if that's the state of affairs up in North End and around the university, then I can't imagine that it's at all anywhere near as safe as that in, in less um, uh, um, places with much worse infrastructure by comparison. Right. right. Yeah. I always think because, you know, I used to ride my bike all around Silicon. I haven't rode a bike in a really long time. Well, me and the mayor rode the, le the electric bikes when we first got them at the city. That was fun. But um, when I think about, you know, there's a there's a hill in still there's lots of hills in Stilcombe. Stilcombe's all hills, but it's also when I was younger, mostly a retired 
community. There wasn't a lot of cars. There's not a lot of big streets. I think about someone who is making the choice, whether for personal reasons or financial reasons, to ride a bike here and these hills <laughs> with big with lots of cars and not a lot of alternative routes. I mean, that does feel really um like that feels like a gamble to me. And maybe that's, you know, me getting older and being like, mm, that's risky. And I don't I don't want to break a hip. Um <laughs> I heard it's really painful. So I I think about like how we know, and this is kind of for all panelists, we know that there's, you know, when I was younger, um, I was 15 and a half and I was like, we need, I need a car. I need a car because I got to have a driver's license. And on my 16th birthday, they're like, what do you want to go? Where do you want to go to dinner? I'm like, DMV. I want a driver's license today. <laughs> right. And um, I have three kids. I have one who gave up her car because she lives in Seattle and for economic reasons, she was like, that's not an expense I want. I've got one who lives with me still and is going to college and he drives. And I have a third one who I paid for driver's ed for him to say that was really stressful. The woman kept smacking my hand when I was trying to turn and I don't want to drive. And she does not want to, he does, he's not interested in a car at all. And I have nieces and nephews that are also like that. So what do you think are some of the other things that are contributing to that trend and the fact that we have a community that's kind of split? Because for some of you who have been here a few times, um, we have an older population who wants like parking spaces and they want to be able to drive up to the stores. And that is a, that's two very different visions of a city to have one that is very friendly to bus riders and, and bicyclists and another one where there's parking right at the front door of every spot. So Fletcher, I'm going to start with you. Um, what are you, so your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think that discussion is really interesting because people assume that because an area is safe for bicycles and friendly for, for other modes of transportation, that it's automatically unfriendly to cars um, when that's not necessarily the reality. It just, improving safety for for one mode of transportation doesn't mean that other modes have to take the hit and with cars you can still have your parking you can still have lanes to go down and you can get to your place just as fast but what people want is just a safe uh separate lane to get there and i think especially in my experience in tacoma there's not a lot of separated lanes there's there's a lot of um areas where there's maybe a, a little spray painted uh, bike icon in the middle of the road. So you're sharing it with with cars and that doesn't necessarily do all that much for safety. There's uh, lanes that are painted onto the road, but those don't always get obeyed by cars. Um, and I think just in, improving the safety of it would increase the ridership a, a lot for, for cycling. Um, and I, I also think that a lot of people are getting are, aren't getting their driver's license because of those those earlier reasons I mentioned climate cost, mental health um, and 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 other factors. but people also realize that younger people especially that living with cars isn't the only way um, to exist in in the world there's there's a, a notion especially in America that um, car ownership and, and using a car is the way that you navigate the world, um, but it's it's not. And I think young people also understand that more and more. Yeah, Matt, what are you, what, you know? What are some of your thoughts about that? Oh man, I have so much. <laughs> what, what I have, I have like two or three minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know. You All right. Know. Um, so uh, we're talking here about uh, why maybe young people aren't choosing to get driver's licenses, why they're choosing not to drive. Yeah. Um, what's contributing to the trend? That's, that's what I'm looking at in front of me, and I have so much to say. The first thing I want to say, I also have a 16-year-old mm -hmm. who just recently got a driver's license, um, who lived through the pandemic inside, trapped from the world. Um, and I was so shocked to learn how difficult it was for him to get a driver's license. And I have a, a good amount of privilege compared to um, so many people in our region. And it was a struggle. It was difficult for him to get a driver's license because of the cost, because of the scheduling, because it's not offered in schools. It's, I, I if, if you do not have a certain amount of privilege, then getting a driver's license at 16 is not even on the table. It's, it's close to a thousand dollars to get a driver's license. Yep. And then you, st then you need a car. So 
I think we have a problem. It's an equity problem in the state of Washington that uh, we assume everybody can afford to get a driver's license when really the people that need a driver's license um, are kids that don't have access to public transportation, can't ride their bicycles because we have no reasonable infrastructure in unincorporated parts of the county, and uh, there's no other options. So we have basic infrastructure in North End Tacoma, in Central Tacoma. Like we, we do have sidewalks more or less, and we do have bike lanes more or less. You go south into, into Midland, Parkland, Spanaway, there's no bike lanes. There's no bicycles drawn on the ground. There's no sidewalks. There's no stop signs. There's no crosswalks. It's crazy. Um, and so kids, they can't get around. So, uh, uh, so if you can't get a driver's license, and there's also pretty sporadic and infrequent and, and inaccessible public transportation, uh, if you can't take the bus, you can't take a bike, you can't buy a car, you can't drive a car, I don't know what you're left with. Um, except right. you're going to struggle and we're just going to reproduce cycles of poverty because uh, kids are stuck indoors. Um, I think compounding this and then I'll stop is again that uh, we've got a generation that if you're an adult, two or three years is really no big deal. But honestly, we all learned how to work remotely. Like our lives shifted dramatically during the pandemic. Uh, we're now, I think most people can be or at least hybrid in their work life balance. Uh -huh. um, that kids, kids experienced that same dramatic shift in lifestyle, right? They were stuck indoors. They got used to living indoors. They got used to not going outside. And turns out you don't really need to go outside. You should. Right. We, we, we do need to recreate. You do need to, to, to be active and see the sunshine and be outside. But if you learned over a couple of years during really formative parts of your life that you don't need to, then you may not want to drive because you don't see a reason to get outside anyway. So, right. There's there's a lot I think with the with younger generations that uh, beyond concerns over climate change we have real class issues that we need we need to address as a region. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. In addition to a lot of the climate and affordability pieces that have been brought up, one thing that we heard from the young people that we talked to that was a big draw to using public transit was the opportunity to exercise a sense of independence. Uh, we had a lot of people saying that they if you know if they're able to take to take transit and it's um, a, a good option for them, then that's that's a nice chance to not have to rely on anyone. They can go where they want to go. They can be with their friends. They can spend their time in getting between point A and point B in different ways. And they would be able to, if they're driving a car and paying attention. Um, and so, yeah, that was that was a big thing that we heard. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I think some of the things we don't think about, like, so um, when my daughter moved back here, she didn't grow up here. We I raised her in Ohio, but she went to the University of Kentucky and she graduated, she came back here. So she's new to the area. She's like, I want to be in proximity to you. She get, lands a job in Seattle as an engineer, good paying job, good, you know, she's done all the right things, right? Um, but she's like, I'm going to stay at home for a year. I'm going to stay with you and I'm going to commute to Seattle because I want to be able to pay off my student loan debt, right? Again, making all the right choices. And it took about two and a half, I don't even know if we made it two months of her being like, I don't get to be 20. I'm not getting to be 25. I spend an hour on the train going to Seattle. I work. If I miss a train because we don't have a regular train, we have a commuter train. So if I miss that last mark, I'm either stuck in Seattle or so I have to, I can't go to a happy hour. I can't do a networking event. I can't do the things to build a network here so that I have, a, you know, a a group of people. I just, I know you and I love you, but that's not enough. And like, we literally went through a couple weeks of just crying about, I don't know how to navigate this um, thing and parking and her job is $300 a month. So she's like, I, even if I borrowed your car, but then if she borrows my car, then who's dropping me off work? And then she's got to live on my schedule, which is crazy. So I think even f when you have tons of privilege, there's these issues. And then if you look at that compounding factors of less privilege, less access to a car, a families that are operating two parents working and kids and one car and people are, you know, I, I remember thinking um, my friend lived in Chicago and she was Ubering, like she was delivering for Uber as a way to make extra cash. And her kids were in the backseat of the Uber doing homework and I'm thinking like we have a serious class issue in this country where we are causing people to have to make really difficult decisions and compounding it by not having good choices to counterbalance those things. So um, 
how much time do we have before questions? We have 10 more minutes before questions. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Um, we've talked a lot about what the issues are. Let's talk a little bit about some solutions. So um, how can agencies and jurisdictions support young people who don't drive or choose to limit their driving? Um, I will say I, uh, I've worked for the city and for now I work for the school district. And at one point it was on our job application that you had to be able to drive. And I had to go back to HR and say, well, why? We're a communications department. Like it'd be helpful, but I don't need my summer intern to drive. Like I, if, if you get here, I just need you to be able to get to where I need you to get. And it is not my business how you get there. So uh, that's one thing that popped into my head. But like, what are some of the things that organizations can do? And McKenna, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think what you're saying um, about how, you know, how we're using transportation and how that connects to our ability to live our lives, we need to first off acknowledge that mobility is a human right. We're all going somewhere and we need to make sure that our system is working for everyone. Um, I think that agencies can really support young writers by seeking out their perspectives listening to them and then making really intentional efforts to respond to that and show that we are investing in their futures. Um, you know, we've, we've all heard really insightful things from, from young people that would really, seeing those become realities would make everyone's lives easier to get around. Um, they have a lot of passion and a lot of great insights and we need to be responsive to that and show that we are making um, making solid investments to to make that a reality. Um, so in my work, I'm generating data information that uh, reflects kids' shared experiences, shared perceptions, um, surfacing opportunities for us to invest. I, I, I kind of see both sides of this coin. We, we need to deal with issues of climate change and, and transportation is a big part of that. We also need to, on a day-to-day on -day basis, provide people the opportunity to uh, live their lives and have a reasonable quality of life. And if that means that uh, we have to invest in infrastructure to support public transportation in parts of the county or parts of the city where ridership may be low, but ridership is necessary, then we probably need to take the hit and uh, know that our buses may be, may be running a little, a little empty, but the people who are riding those buses absolutely need them. Yep. Um, yep. Those are investments that that don't make good financial sense, but they make good social sense. They're 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 equitable decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we need to respond to what our youth are telling us about uh, active transportation and their ability or inability to move around. Um, there's a basic level of infrastructure that's that's needed to to provide people these opportunities. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, we have perfect bike lanes everywhere, but maybe just reasonable sidewalks and crosswalks. Um, right. So right. there's there's some basic steps we can take that that will provide people those those daily opportunities to live their lives, and then we can think bigger and more broadly about how we deal with things like climate change. I, yeah. I they're they're two they're they're related but separate conversations. Uh, it reminds me of a project that was uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, called the Upper University Circle Project, and they they were trying to get people from low income neighborhoods to take the jobs at the universities and the hospitals, and then one of the things they figured out was like transportation was an issue and the transit authority was like, well, we have these routes and we can't really fix them. And those, the hospitals themselves, the hospitals and the university said, we'll put in the stop. We'll cover the stop because it's Cleveland and it snows and it's cold. We'll, we'll put in the stop. We'll cover another question. No one who's here from uh, Pierce Transit, but it's Washington. It rains. Why are not all the stops covered? But well, another day. Um, but so they but they put in this stop so that there was a place like you know the agency had to say to the transit authority we know we have staff here that need public transportation and we're going to do that and we should be able to do that too we know that there's only a couple movie theaters then there should be routes to movie theaters because kids go to movie theaters and we know that and that's not new kids go to roller skating rinks and so it shouldn't be hard for them to get to university place to get to the only roller skating rink around here like that, it's a great point, and uh, uh, something that is, is both fascinating and sad and probably not surprising is that uh, kids are spending a lot of time at the mall and the Lakewood Town Center, like a lot of time. I mean, uh, and coincidentally, we have a transit center at the mall and at the Lakewood Town Center. Um, 
perhaps we don't just place transit centers or those hubs of activity at uh, places like the mall and the town center, but maybe at Stewart Heights Park, Wright Park. Maybe, maybe we open up opportunities outside of these commercial areas for kids to get out and do something other than walk around the mall. Right. And I don't even know what they're walking around at Lakewood Town Center, but that's also another day. Um, <laughs> but you? Um, yeah, to echo what Matt said, um, building transit or or even just any sort of access to places where kids can can do things other than getting to work or getting to a job, um, making it that that helps. I feel like release some of the the stigma attached to to taking transit as well. Um, because it's it's not just something that's a, a necessary um, thing that's being used. It's it's something that people want to take to go to a movie or or go to the park or 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 things outside of the the necessary things in life. Um, and I think um, building it and 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 expanding transit access to where where people want to use it, not just need to use it, would help with that. Um, do do you know how um, how many um, like do do young people eighteen and younger do they know? And I guess this is more a question for you. McKenna, do they know they have free transit? Because that's also one of those things. Like, do they know that that's something that they have access to? Yeah, we asked this in our focus groups, and uh, I believe the numbers were that eighty five percent of the people that we talked to already knew that they had access to it. So. That's that's a pretty high amount, about eighty five kids. Um, but there still are some that were that were still learning. This was also um, a year ago, and so at that point, they were the new policies were were just a couple months old. Um, so that hopefully has gone up. Okay, I was just thinking about. Um, so in Seattle, if you have a library card, you also have access to like all these museums. And I started asking like younger people, like, do you know that? Yeah, and they're like, no. I didn't, I didn't know that. And I'm like, oh, well, if you get a library card, <laughs> I'm about to get me one. Um, you can go to like all the museums. You can go to all these places, the Woodland Park Zoo. And I don't know if we do a good job communicating those types of, I don't, I don't know that we have those programs here, but I know like with Tacoma Create, if you're a Tacoma Public School student, you would get discounts at a lot of their programs that happen outside of school. But do kids know that? Do they know they can go to the Grand for free? And it, once they know that, is there a way for them to get to the grand, right? Like if, if it doesn't do any good if the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing and that we're not coordinating those things. Um, I think I went to three concerts at Climate Pledge before I realized that the light rail was included in your ticket when you buy a ticket to Climate Pledge. It's Climate Pledge. The entire inside is about air, you know, being good citizens. And, but it took me three trips, three concerts before I realized it is in your ticket that you get can ride the light rail to Climate Pledge. So like, I think we assume sometimes that people know these things, but you have to have the time and the luxury of time to like think about those things and, you know, happen to have a guy be like, hey, open your ticket. Oh, let you up this oh, you know, open your ticket. You can just get on here for free. I'm like, oh, thank you. I've only paid for this four times for no reason. Yeah, I, I think awareness is definitely a big part of it too. And I think if you ask students at the university that I go to, if they knew that there were bus stops uh, around the campus, um, most of them wouldn't say that they know they exist. Um, and part of that is just because it's a street sign with a little number on it. So it doesn't really indicate much of a bus stop. But also there's not really much um, being done, I feel like, to target university students or, or younger people to let them know that there are transit options available. And I know, for example, at my school, there are free ORCA cards that you can check out. And in my class of, of 20 or 30 uh, environmental policy students who you would assume are some of the most well-educated about transit uh, opportunities, only a few of them even knew that that existed. So it's it's uh, awareness is an issue everywhere, I think. Yeah. Um, so for the people in the audience, it is question time. So if you have a question, go ahead and write it and Laura will come around and pick it, pick it up. Questions from our participants on um, the Zoom. And so thank you for that. And we're gonna kick into some of those questions. Um, Matt, I'm going to ask you this question. How can the youth of Tacoma find avenues for advocacy? And, and what are some ways that they maybe can plug in to talk about what they need? Um, well, there are 
many, many youth councils that already exist. Um, I would also say that uh, that's it's something that, that I'm working on directly with uh, with the action mapping project. I, I met with um, with Ronnie yesterday from Tacoma Public Schools, uh, who who uh, is the assistant director of the whole child whole child work that's happening uh, in Tacoma Public Schools. Met with uh, folks from Beyond the Bell at Metro Parks, and we're talking about um, regional councils of youth in Tacoma. Um, that that would uh, reflect on data that are being generated in schools. So I think uh, there's there's a lot of agencies, parks, city planning, health departments, small nonprofits that want to hear from youth. Those uh, opportunities to plug into actual um, projects are are fewer and further between. I I think unfortunately we we do like to have councils, but we don't often. Do much in response to what they say. It's it's window dressing. So there there's increasingly I think moves being made in in the region and not just in Tacoma but in, in the I five corridor to engage youth in in um, planning practices um, for the Parkland area specifically. I've worked on two projects now related to Gagne Park and then the Pacific Avenue one twelfth intersection that that have involved youth and the ways they're rethinking. Uh, both what, what is a recreational public space, like a park supposed to, what are the functions that it serves, and how might we rethink something like Gagne Park in Parkland, which right now is just a big grass field, but mm -hmm. could do so much more. One of the problems there is that just getting to the park, whether you're on your bike or on your feet, um, is, is near impossible without uh, walking in the middle of the street. So yeah. those opportunities are growing. I think we're, we're paying more attention. I don't know right now that uh, outside of seeking those out, it's, it's clear. It's, it's again, like with ORCA cards, you don't know until you know. And then finding those students who want to be engaged is, it's important to get them engaged because we're, we're cultivating the next generation of change makers in the region by doing that. Yeah. Um, so Fletcher, I'm gonna ask you this question because you appear to be, I'm gonna say, you appear to be the youngest person on this panel. I do. I, I do. I do look good for my age, but you appear to be the youngest person. Um, how how can we empower youth in creating new ways of seeing how housing, climate, and transit all intertwine? Because I think we talk about them as very separate things, but like they really are, you know, connected and, and influencing each other. So, what are some ways you think we could do a better job of that? Yeah, obviously they they are very connected. There's there's issues of of housing density connected to to transit, which all of that is connected to climate in a way. Um, and I think to to empower young people to to get involved with it, there has to be some sort of like semblance of of action from the top, from the people who already have um, some sort of say in the issue, um, to make it seem like it's not some big monolithic thing that can't be changed. Um, so I think um, making it seem like it's not an afterthought, making the making climate choices seem like they're not an afterthought, and and transit and and housing seem like they're they're not all things that are kind of brushed to the side and and dealt with in a, a very minimal way. It it needs to seem like there's actual um, care and effort being put into it from the people who already make the decisions, and I think that would um, influence younger people to be more involved with it. Yeah. McKenna, I think this question's for you. Um, you know, all of you on the panel have mentioned like the need infrastructure needs and in, uh, across Tacoma, there are huge needs for building out of sidewalks and biking networks. And, and this makes, this takes significant funding. Um, so as an, a, a person who works for an advocacy organization, um, what opportunities do you see for, for all of us in this room and youth, I added that part, to advocate um, to elected leaders for funding for those things? Yeah, so I work at the statewide level, and so I'm, of course, going to gonna, gonna um, push you all to be contacting your state legislators. <laughs> um, the, the state legislature in Washington is in session, meaning that our elected officials are actively working on, on laws and policies in the beginning part of the year. So that, that is still going on right now. Um, and being involved in the, the rest of the year though too, writing to them, letting them know what's, what's working or what's not working in your district, what you wanna see more funding go towards um, from the state level, it, it makes a difference. They wanna hear from you and they're there to represent you. 
Um, and so, yeah, that's that's definitely an area that I would point people towards for for the big bucket state funding. It's uh, it's different if we're looking at you know specific streets or specific projects um, that's going to be done more at the local level. Um, and then there also are, uh, to what you, what you were saying earlier, there are state youth councils as well too. So there's opportunities for young people to get involved at various levels of government and let their voice be heard on anything from big bucket funding to specific crosswalks and sidewalks that need to be fixed. This is an interesting question. I don't know who wants to take it. Um, what relationships would you like to see transit agencies building to help more young people learn about free youth fare and transit? I can just say a quick thing on this is that when youth ride free policies started to go into effect, we did see lots of, of partnerships either being developed or being strengthened between uh, transit agencies and schools uh, to, to get the word out that way. Um, I'm sure that what that looked like varied from, you know, city to city, district to district, um, but that that's a, a great way to, to reach kids. And then we also have seen a lot of um, collaboration with library systems. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, different public spaces where we know kids and families are, are going to, bringing that information to those spaces and letting them know where they are. I would love to see organizations as they advertise like events and things like that put it just put it on the flyer that like mm -hmm. if you're under 18 and remember you have access to free transportation as like we say we want kids to come certain places but we don't tell them direct it <laughs> yeah. at them yeah i i think so i i say this a lot at meetings um i think that we need to go where the kids are uh, because if we ask the kids to come where we are uh, you're going to get the same kids showing up the kids that have enough privilege and uh, capacity to get there um, it's why I work in classrooms, uh, in schools, uh, they are there. They're necessarily there. Even the kids who are quiet and never leave their home for anything else, they're in those classrooms. And I think those are the stories we need to hear. Those are the voices we need to hear. Youth councils are composed of, uh, of a subset of kids that are all very similar, right? They're, they're ambitious and they're motivated and they're, they're great. Uh, I don't know they're fully representative of, um, all kids. And a lot of those kids are very quiet, but when you're in a classroom where they're comfortable, They'll share and they'll tell you stories about walking a mile to get to a bus stop so they can take the bus to get to their job at McDonald's. Um, those stories exist, but I don't think you're going to hear those in, right. in a youth council. And so I'd encourage public transit agencies to uh, take some time, use their engagement folks and go schedule some time in classes, like yeah. in schools, especially schools in more distressed parts of our city and, and region. I think the crazy part, like when you were just saying that about like kids having to walk these really, you know, far away from where they're at to get to, you know, to cross the street and stuff. I mean, these problems aren't isolated to kids. Like this is one lens on it. But when we talked a couple of years ago about people with disabilities, it was the same thing. Like there's only a curb ramp at the end of the street. I actually have to, I have to take my wheelchair down an extra two blocks to cross and then come back when the actual bus stop is across the street from where I actually live, but I would have to cross four lanes in a wheelchair without a, a ramp, you know, without a, 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 what you call it. So they're not, if we, if we, you know, used something like targeted universalism to say like, who's, who is the person that most needs the service and created for them, we would solve lots of other people's issues at the same time. So the challenge is that's so much more expensive. So we just need to wrap our heads around and be okay with it. Right, yeah. right. I mean, we spend lots of money on other things, again, for another day. <laughs> um, Fletcher, um, you mentioned mental health as one of the reasons you get, around, you get around using sustainable transportation. Beyond avoiding the stress of driving, are, what are the other mental health reasons you choose active transportation? I think... Uh, Especially for cycling, I've since I've I've been cycling more often in the past few years. Um, it, there's obviously a, a very big physical health component of it, and and with that um, comes mental health benefits from from being physically healthy. Which there's plenty of studies out there that you could look at um, that would tell you that. Um, and and I think also being able to to do it in in a group, doing doing things like that with your friends. Um, or, or being social while you're, you're getting around. There's, 
there's just so many layers to it um, that are, are kind of stripped away when you're in your little metal box traveling down the down the road by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it opens up a lot of a lot of social opportunities as well that, that impact that. Yeah. Um, so Matt, you just mentioned that, you know, infrastructure and the cost of inf infrastructure is usually the reason why we don't do it. And this question is that, you know, why is infrastructure the most common lens for change and how do we shift that toward opportunities in education? And, and honestly, I mean, my question added onto this question is, can we really, does opportunities in education get us there or do we just have to make the investments? I'm processing <laughs> <laughs> opportunities in education. Uh, so what um, I'm not sure what opportunities means in that context. Education, I understand. Um, knowing that I have access to an ORC card if I'm a kid, um, that's great. Uh, if I can't get to a safe bus stop, then that ORCA card really is of no use to me, mm -hmm. um, especially if I have so many other stresses in my life that uh, are, are existential. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not talking about I'm stressed because I can't go to the movies. I'm stressed because I might not have anything to eat or my parents may not be coming home tonight and I've got younger siblings I have to take care of. Right. Uh, so I, I don't, I truly think that, so I, I think the money is there. I, I think the infrastructure money is there. I think the problem is that the way we allocate that um, reflects uh, a response to the loudest voices and those loudest voices aren't always coming from the places of greatest need, uh, which is why we need to find ways. And that's what that's what I'm doing with AMP. We need to find ways to tap into that that collective consciousness of folks who have greater need and respond to them. And if that means that in the North End we don't get better bike lanes, you know we got bike lanes. Um, they may not be perfect, but we got them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in the South End and in Midland and Parkland, we don't even have sidewalks. Um, right. So, but but that that engagement right and that's that's the hardest part of doing anything well, urban planning community development is engaging and having the right people at the table so maybe the table doesn't need to be our table maybe it needs to be other folks table and we need to find those gatekeepers it's it's hard right it's hard work right. but there is i think there is there are enough resources it's just directing those resources to the right places um yeah. if right means return on investment is increased quality of life for folks who need that right and I think there's also perception like, you know, we're talking about, you know, Midland, Spanaway, you know, unincorporated Pierce County and some of these other neighborhoods. But like it's in places where you wouldn't necessarily suspect it. Um, I have a friend who's on the council for University Place. And when you drive through University Places and all the places that we would go in University Place, Trader Joe's and all that, there's sidewalks and there's like curb cuts and there's pretty trees. But if you turn off of any of those streets, once you're away from Curtis High School, there's no sidewalks in University Place. Yeah. And they were talking about how neighbors were upset that kids were trampling through their yards. Well, if there's no sidewalk for them to walk on and there's cars driving by, what would you would you rather them trample your tulips or a car? Like, yeah. but we're forcing kids with undeveloped frontal lobes to make these decisions rather than invest in making the sidewalk where you can clearly say, walk on the sidewalk. We tell them all the places they can't skateboard or they can't ride their bike. We don't create, we don't have the same energy about creating the spaces where they can and they should. Yeah, and you know, there's a good example in Tacoma. We spent a lot of money as a region on the Eastside Community Center down next to First Creek Middle School. It's off Portland Avenue. Beautiful, beautiful new building, new-ish. I mean, but uh, um, getting to the community center in East Side is uh, treacherous. If you haven't been, you should go check it out. It's just south of Salishan off Portland Avenue. Decide for yourself if you'd want to walk there from a neighborhood. I wouldn't. There's a there's a traffic beacon that went in. It's one way to cross Portland. I I wouldn't want to cross Portland at the beacon, and uh, the intersection front of East Side is rough. So it's basically a destination you're going to drive to it. And I think that's what it's become is a regional destination rather than a community center. Sorry, I know we're right. over time. No, that's great. Um, well, thank you. I told you this is going to be a good conversation. I knew once we got really into it. Um, I do want to also say before we wrap up, it also gets dark here at 430, like midnight dark at 430. And so uh, just think about if you're a kid and you've got practice and you get out of practice and then you have to navigate that as well. So um with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Laura. And thank you guys for being with us again today. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Let's give a round of applause to the panel.
I know people on Zoom, I don't think you can hear the clapping, but it's happening. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much to all of our panelists uh, for sharing their expertise with us today. That was awesome. Um, and thank you, as always, to Tanisha for moderating a great conversation. Um, I wanna let everyone know that we have one more Friday Forum this year. It is on March 29th. Um, it's called Following the Numbers, Affordable Housing and Density, and we hope that you'll join us there. You can register now at downtownonthego.org. Um, a recording of this forum will be available on our social media accounts probably on Monday, uh, so you can share it with all your friends uh, who weren't able to tune in today. Um, and with that, thank you very much, and we will see you in March. Thanks. <laughs>